Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our participants from Europe, the US, and Australia. And welcome to the Forecasting 2 session of the ESIG 2020 Meteorology and Market Design for Grid Services Workshop, being held online on Tuesdays and Thursdays during the month of June. I'm Charlie Smith, the Executive Director of ESIG, and I will provide a few brief opening remarks. As most of you know, we were originally planning to do our annual forecasting and markets workshop in Denver this month, but due to the coronavirus situation, we found it necessary to move the workshop online. The workshop was planned with the input of our ESIG offerings committee, chaired by Bethany Fru of NREL and co-chaired by Julia Matoivasan of ERCOT. The committee consists of the chairs of our six working groups and several of our board members. We have a great set of volunteers who make ESIG what it is, and we encourage you to become members and get involved if you haven't already. Regarding logistics, I would like <clears throat> to ask you to note that the webinar will be an hour long. We will have three individual presentations and we plan to hold the questions for a 15 minute Q&A after the last speaker. We're trying something a little different for the Q&A going forward. Attendees are requested to ask their questions through the Slido platform you will not be able to ask your questions through the WebEx. You should go to slido.com on your device and enter today's date, June 18, as the event code to ask questions of the panelists. Please note the person to whom you are addressing the question. The instructions are also in the webinar announcement at the bottom of the session information box on the website, and you will be reminded by the session chair. You'll see a thumbs up button next to the question I'll prioritize the questions submitted. So please keep the questions coming during the presentations and we will address them at the end. Recognizing the limitations of a webinar with typically more than 100 people on the line, the lines will be muted. So again, we ask you to use the Slido platform to ask your questions with June 18 as the event code. Today, we're hosting the Forecasting 2 session on extreme weather events chaired by Josh Novacek of NREL, with Craig Collier of Energy Forecasting Solutions serving as co-chair. Josh is a research engineer at NREL, doing research on power system planning and operations, including issues associated with high penetrations of renewable energy. Craig is Chief Meteorologist and Head of Operations at Energy Forecasting Solutions. Both are regular contributors to ESIG. Josh will manage the session logistics and Craig will handle the Q&A. I've known both Josh and Craig and worked together with them for many years now and consider them both good friends. Josh and Craig, we appreciate having you here and I'll now turn it over to you, Josh. Great, thank you, Charlie. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for attending uh, this Extreme Weather Events webinar. Uh, we have three uh, great uh, uh, speakers today who come from diverse backgrounds within the power system and meteorology uh, to give us uh, their take on extreme weather events, uh, especially uh, as we move forward into higher variable generation futures in our power system. Our first speaker today is uh, Justin Sharp, uh, who will be uh, talking today about some work that uh, the two of us are participating together on uh, around modeling uh, future uh, extreme events in future power systems. Uh, so while the, uh, we get the presentation passed over to him, I'll introduce Justin. So Justin Sharp is the owner and principal at Sharply Focused, a consultancy that specializes in bridging and uh, the knowledge and cultural divide between atmospheric scientists and electric utility and the electric utility sector. In his role, Dr. Sharp provides a range of consulting services, including training, analytics, and strategic planning for grid transition. In all cases, the vision is to utilize meteorological knowledge uh, to advance and optimize the transition to weather-driven renewables. Prior to creating Sharply Focus, Justin envisioned, planned, built, and directed the Operational Meteorology Division at Iberdrola Renewables, which continues to provide 24-7 trading and operation asset management support to the Iberdrola Renewables fleet. Dr. Sharp has a PhD in Atmospheric Science from the University of Washington, 25 plus years of experience as a meteorologist, and 14 years of energy sector expertise. With that, Justin, I'll turn it over to you.
Justin, I think you may still be on mute. Now, Justin, I don't know if you're having an audio problem or not, but we can't hear you. I think you're still on mute and we can't see your video either. Ryan, can you tell what's, uh, what's going on with Justin? Uh, no, we might just want to move on to it and come back to him. Oh, All right. hang on. Ulrich, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, we're going to go ahead and uh, continue with you and come back to Justin later once we get what's gone wrong resolved. So, Josh, back to you. Great, yeah. Yeah, sounds good. All right, so I'll, I'll introduce Ulrich here. So Dr. Ulrich Falken is an expert in grid and market integration of renewable energies, in particular uh, ancillary services with variable renewable energies. He's the founder and managing director of the International Power Forecast and in, in Virtual Power Plant Power Output Control Market Leader Energy and Media Systems which is forecasting about 300 gigawatts of wind power and 150 gigawatts of solar power and remote controlling more than 80 gigawatts of solar and wind power plants. Ulrich, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the possibility to have a talk here as every year. Unfortunately, we are not personally and have the discussion in the breaks, which always is one of the most important at the Ulrich, but I hope, I hope I can transport some information here as well. So, I will talk a little bit about the impacts of extreme weather events on wind and solar forecasts, and my focus will be here on how we mitigate the problem. First, some thanks to Alex, who is here also, uh, free, who provided the presentation for me. So, uh, how do I... Does it work? No. I have click here. Um, first, just uh, I don't I need the introduction anymore because uh, it's already done by you before, so I step over to my slides. I want to go talk about uh, weather events, and there's different weather extreme events which are important. One is put together with... Hey, Josh. Of... I don't know what the heck extreme is going on. Events. Okay. Um, just I, I'm just uh, taking over, Justin, and you can go afterwards. That's fine. I just started my presentation. Okay, so um, I, what what is what they have all together? This extreme weather events that they are all very difficult to forecast. So if we talk about, for example, high wind cutoffs, which is uh, um, then they turn off due to high wind it's at 25 to 35 meters per second, and in this range, it's very difficult to forecast if it's exactly um, 30 30 meters per second or 31. Second thing more for solar is fog, which is not captured well by the today's numerical weather prediction. So this is something which really has to do on, on a manual basis afterwards. And I will come to the mitigation, which is a, a better thing than the forecasting itself for that. Third thing which I mentioned here is, want to mention here is smoke and dust to burning woods, which we have in Texas, for example, sometimes. Then important thing is icing. Uh, I will have my talk on this picture specific extreme event later on. So this will be focused for afterwards. Uh, some others are thunderstorms with a very peak on a wind speed when the thunderstorm comes and uh, a decrease of uh, power in the same manner really, really fast. On snow on solar panels, it, it's normally not the problem to forecast the snow which comes down, but more when it slips off. So there is still snow, but it slips off from the modules easy before the snow disappears everywhere. And of course, there's very, very rare situations of low and high temperature cuts off because this is an extreme weather situation if it's below 40 degrees Celsius. But we had this event this winter, and it was really something which we have seen only once or twice in that range where uh, Mike was really excited because uh, uh, not really friendly excited, I have to say here, 
because they last a lot of gigawatts uh, in a very, very short time. But I want to talk today about uh, icing or wind turbines, which is a, a, a big topic for all, nearly all U.S. ISOs. And uh, we've, we see that a lot at MISO, at PGM, at SAP, even tech at Aircon. And uh, what, the, what the thing here is, is what you need for, for icing is that you need uh, freezing rain. So, and, and then they get partially iced and, and shut down. Um, the problem is not here that when they are iced, uh, to, to focus exactly when they are iced, but also that uh, they stay iced after a long time after the freezing rain already disappeared for hours or sometimes also for days. So one example, in Germany, we had an, an, a, a situation two years ago when, where there was icing and then the freezing of the rotor blades was there for four days. And there was so much so, snow that nobody can come to the wind turbines. And so there was 20% of the whole German capacity of wind was iced for several days. So coming to the forecasting, what is important to forecast icing of, on turbines is, of course, temperature at different heights, is the temper, temporal temperature changes, most important special temperature distribution of precipitation and freezing rain. And this is something, if you come not from the quality side, but from the perspective of, on, on turbines, is if they have the possible winter packages, so is there heating allocated at the turbines? And this is information is not always accurately available, and it's not always available what kind of heating systems are there. So if we come to some uh, scenarios, how that looks like, some, some examples. So what we can see here is a black line is a measurement, the red line is a forecast. On the top, we see the effect on a single plant, and we see here a, a time range of uh, approximately three days. So. We see here in the beginning, after half a day, the icing and uh, the power for the whole plant falls to zero, and then it lacks eight, 10, 12 hours until it comes back. And it's not clear where, 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 um, how, how, how long this uh, can, uh, um, is here. If we go back to the portfolio size, then it looks like this. We were now here have a time frame of one and a half days. And um, you can see that even on the large portfolio, which is MISO here already and uh, is here, uh, on, on, on 12 gigawatt production, we have three gigawatt on loss. And this is just what happens. To forecast this, if this is three gigawatt, or if this is uh, what we can see here, up to seven gigawatt, this is the big problem, and this is a, a really challenge on doing this. So what we see here, if we talk about extreme events, especially icing here in this case, is of course we have to do the level best to forecast it, but uh, the mitigation how to do this and the situation awareness is far more important. So what we deliver here is the scenario without icing, the, the worst case scenario, and a best case scenario. And we tell the operator that it's not likely that the best case scenario will come. So this is a good example. There are other examples which does not look like that at all. So the situational awareness to the operator is the most important. So what we have developed here is something on, on icing reports, which gives an overview and, and, and gives them more ideas of what could happen and where it could happen. And the second thing is what we do is we, we do some manual adaption on the forecast and we, we really stay in, in direct contact to the operators. We update it frequently every hour on what app happens, give them our ideas, how it looks like. So coming, coming to the report, how this report could look like. So this is ICE report which we developed, which we deliver to our customers on a regular basis when there, uh, there is um, the risk of icing. I want to see on the right side is a map where on the dark gray it's above the zero degree and the low the, the light gray is uh, below zero degrees and purple it's freezing it's really strong or freezing and you can see here the, the the dark red areas is areas where there's a high risk of icing and the orange areas where there is a possibility of icing and 
the black dots are all the wind farms. So the operator has an idea not on how much it could be iced, but where also, which is very important for the for the operator to get a fast view. Okay, which lines this could be uh, that could be icing on, or wind farms which affect which lines. This is the thing. On the left side below, you can see then the range, and what you can see here is that the the no icing is at at, at 13 gigawatt, and the worst case is about 4 gigawatt. So there's 7 gigawatt on range, and the really important is on this issue is not, as I just mentioned, to give an idea to the operator what could happen and really on ha holding hands of them, giving them feedback every hour and we update this ICN report on an hourly basis, two hourly basis in the very extreme event, which we had this year, this winter a lot. There were several times where there was really uh, six, seven, eight gigs of, of ice uh, wind turbines and I think it was uh, Mice was quite happy on how we how we put them information and we how we provide information and update information. And that's already also all, everything I want to say. So uh, to make short conclusion on that, I think you to freezing rain is crucial wind power production in the, and especially in the US. And they significantly reduce power even on portfolio level. And the mitigation, the most important is here providing scenarios, providing ideas on what could happen and make some, some short, inter, very short interaction with the operator to let them know what, what, what changes over time. And uh, that's all I want to say on this topic and uh, looking forward to your questions. Okay, Josh, I think it's back to you. I think you're on, uh, you're on mute, Josh. And Josh, I'm going to speak in the hope that you can hear me. Can folks confirm they can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Justin. We see your, uh, your video and we can hear you. Great. The ball. Okay, Justin, go ahead and share your screen. Go ahead and get started. Yeah, Thank I you. went ahead and did that. Okay, uh, I'll just, uh, can you see my screen? Uh, yeah. we, we see the view with presenter the... mode right now. You see, you see the presentation? Yes. But it's in presenter okay. mode. Do you see the wrong screen? No, it's all right. Just go ahead. Okay. Okay. So, um, as Josh mentioned, sorry about the uh, technical di uh, difficulties that we had. I'm going to present uh, some some work that uh, Josh and I and some of the folks at uh, NREL have been doing, along with some kind of um, some thought leadership comments on, on the, uh, the issues around um, the grid of the future and extreme weather. Um, before I go any further, I probably should acknowledge um, Josh and uh, Marty and Zach and Grant Buster and Michael Russell, all of who have uh, put quite a lot of effort into um, this project. Um, this is the NREL disclaimer. I won't go into the details, but basically, please don't take any photographs or uh, distribute any of this stuff outside of uh, this group. Um, so my objective today is to basically give a little bit of a context of uh, meteorology and the energy transition, and then to provide some guidance on uh, important ways that uh, meteorology will change the grid of the future uh, using these preliminary results. So basically, we're in this energy transition, as most of you know where we're moving from a fossil fuel based system, which is basically weather modulated um, in load um, with a little bit of weather modulation in generation right now to a, a system that will be strongly correlated um, between uh, weather, uh, weather and generation. And generation will become uh, the primary driver. Um, the, weather, weather, the impact on, of weather on variable um, generation will become the primary driver of um, 
of ex excursions in supply and demand. And how we plan for this will ultimately um, determine how efficiently we can reduce our fossil fuel usage. And so what that means is that meteorology is becoming increasingly important um, within the system in ways that I think a lot of people aren't fully grasping yet. Um, right now, it's set into two silos of resource assessment and forecasting. And the reality is that all of these things work synergistically together as uh, one complete system it impacts the resource adequacy and capacity value determination, um, transmission planning and operations and markets. And I'm finding that resource adequacy and capacity value determination part, which is sort of what we're involved with, with in, in this tail event project, to actually be something that clients are now starting to ask for. So that's a very positive sign. Um, so, uh, to put that in a different way, um, a geologist is to oil and gas as a meteorologist is to um, the evolving grid of the future. And uh, this one is for hire and particularly interested in anything um, that is strategic and policy related. Um, so, coming to the uh, coming to the the impact of the uh, weather tails on high penetration renewables. Um, this is a fairly big project. My role in it is basically to identify um, significant events um, that are in the tails and to provide the meteorological support. And then the role that NREL is, is playing is to um, model, uh, um, is, to, is to basically build out the system of the future using the REEDS model and then take those specific cases and go down into the uh, production uh, cost modeling. And so the, the slide I have right here basically shows um, a flow diagram of what we're doing. Um, we have the capacity expansion model, which is REEDS, um, distribution, distributed generation model that all feed into the scenarios um, that we basically identified and I'll explain how we identified them in a minute. And then we're going into a sort of deeper dive um, with Plexo. So I'm not gonna present any of those results today. Um, so how did we figure out uh, where the tails were and uh, come up with these uh, case studies? We used um, basically three data sets. One is the wind toolkit, which uh, was produced by Vaisala um, a few years ago and has, has been extended by NREL um, for 2010 through 2013. I believe that DOE has just provided some funding to extend it further, which is a, a really, really great news. It's something that uh, I've been pushing for for a while um, to have that updated on an ongoing basis. Um, so basically that's a five minute resolution map with uh, uh, two by two spatial resolution. We, were, we only had access to the one hour data though. Uh, and then we have NSRDB, which is used to identify the solar resource, uh, which is a four by four spatial resolution with 30 minute uh, resolution. And then um, the other data set that I utilized was the local climatological data set, which comes from uh, what used to be NCDC, uh, NOAA NCDC, it's now the National Centers for Environmental Information. And basically I, I uh, downloaded um, hourly weather data uh, and major meteorological fields, and then summary of the day data from this local climatological data set, which provides us with max and min temperatures, deviations from normal heating and cooling degree days on a, on a daily basis. And then we can dive down into the hourly data as well. So um, this is an animation that basically shows us how operators need to plan for extreme loads, right? We're, that's usually what we are all thinking about when we're thinking about how the system's going to function in a resilient and reliable way is what happens when we get these big load excursions. In this case, I'm showing a heat wave and you can see how very much the load is being driven by the heat in the center of the country as that heat comes up into the 40s degrees Celsius, so that's over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. You see the load spike due to um, people using air conditioners that goes down at night and then comes back up again. So um, that has been the traditional mechanism for trying to figure out how to plan the grid. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. We have in, in our data record from 2007 through 2013, that's that seven day tooth just cut out. That's seven day record, uh, seven year record rather, um, uh, 8th, 19th through the 
warmest period in that routing to the uh, local climate data from NCDC. And this is a plot here that shows uh, the hourly plot of load um, scaled to 2036 load values um, for this period. And you can see that in the uh, eastern interconnect, the loads are well above um, normal, uh, a good a good 15 to 20% above normal. And uh, on the right-hand side, you see a distribution of um, the 29 days surrounding the middle of this event uh, cast over the entire seven-day data set. So if you imagine the event started in the middle of July, it would be all of the, it would be basically 29 days in July for each of the seven years. And then what we've done is we've marked each of the days in this event on that distribution. And all these graphics that I'm about to show you will be the same. They will have a 29-day window across the seven years, and then they'll be marked with the actual events. And so you can see that this is an extreme load event. It is in the tails of the load distribution um, for, uh, for at least um, three of the days. And then 723 is also um, some, somewhat in the tail. For ERCOT, um, it's falling just to the uh, high side of the median of the distribution and similarly for, uh, for the West. This was actually the first, second, third, and fourth highest uh, temperatures across the nation when we averaged across all the big load centers uh, during that data set. So let's have a look at the wind and solar resource during this time. We see that in the West and the East and ERCOT, the solar on average is actually slightly higher than normal. Um, the dashed line is the average for that particular period. And you can see in the distributions, they're falling pretty close to the middle, um, with the exception of one day in ERCOT that falls on the, on the low end the very first day. On the wind side, we have a similar uh, scenario. The, uh, the uh, wind resource is better than average in the West until the last two days. It's better than average uh, or close to average uh, for most of the time in the East, with the exception of the first day where it's a little bit low, and it's well above average um, in uh, Texas. So if we now cast that impact onto the top of the load so that we get a residual net load, um, net of renewables, um, we, we see a plot that looks like this. And now we actually see that during the event, our net load for the Western interconnect is below um, the average for the period. Um, our net load for the Eastern interconnect is above, but that gap has closed significantly. And this event has shifted out of the tails. It's still very close to the tail, but it's no longer a tail event. And this is really significant because um, that uh, that tail is is where the cost is, um, and so this is a very significant result, um, and uh, basically shifts us out for the eastern interconnect. And then in in Texas, because the wind was so good in Texas uh, during this period, it actually ends up being a below normal um, load event, uh, net load event, and. Uh, we can recast that to 2050. So that was for 2036, uh, based on, on scaling the loads for 2036 and the renewables build out to 2036 using reads. Now, if we look at a renewables build out to 2050 and then use the, use the actual data from our wind and solar data sets to, to predict what the uh, power output would be hour by hour, this is what we get in 2050. Because we've got more renewables, that gap closes even further. And now what you see is the renewables have actually shifted the, uh, the Eastern Interconnect event to be a good way outside of the tails. It's not, we're not operating the system uh, close to the edge. And this, this is going to be uh, examined in more detail in some of the production cost modeling a little later on. Um, and similarly for, t for Texas, uh, we've, we've pushed the curve off to the right. This is something that uh, we've seen in a number of events, it's not just this one event. Typically, extreme heat does not correlate with poor weather, sorry, with poor wind and solar resource over study areas. I mean, that sort of makes sense if it's really warm, the chances are it's not cloudy. Um, although, obviously, heat does reduce the, the efficiency of the solar panels. And quite often, if you have um, very warm temperatures, that does enhance the impact of the low-level jet, um, which drives the wind resource in the middle of the country. So uh, one of the 
works in progress is to do a definitive uh, analysis of the impact of this. It's not something that's funded in this phase, but we're hoping to get some additional funding to perhaps look at if um, across all events, this is typically the case. Um, so comparing this now with a period in August uh, 2010, and I'm gonna go quite quickly through this because I don't have a huge amount of time. I wanna to get to another event. Um, what we see here is this was an event that didn't fall in the top, uh, the top 10 of, of load, um, but uh, it, it, um, it was, I think it was 14th on one day and the other days were in the 200s, 300s out of the data set. So pretty, pretty close to the middle. And you can see that this in the load profile, uh, you can see loads in the West are below normal. Um, the distributions are all falling to the, um, to the right hand side or the lower side of the, the median. Um, in, the, in the east, they're uh, falling to the high side of the median on uh, three of the days, but not all the way into the tails, similarly in Texas, which was warm. But if we now look at the wind resource and the solar resource, we see solar is a roundabout average and we see that uh, the wind is below average. And for three of the days, it's well below average in, uh, in the uh, Eastern interconnect and for two of the days below average in uh, Texas. And so uh, one of the other things that's worth noting here, by the way, uh, which I wanted to raise was that there is this very good anti-correlation between wind and solar. And this, I always knew this, but it, doing this project, it really struck me how strong that is in the US. The wind obviously tends to peak at night in the US because of the low level jet impacts and also just general stability impacts everywhere. It tends to peak at night. Um, and then the solar peaks in the day. So this whole idea of a wind solar uh, um, kind of synergy is uh, really important in grid planning in the future. And uh, should, we, we should make sure that we're taking it into consideration along with geographic diversity. So anyway, we have this low wind period in the east and in Texas. And uh, the impact of that is that we actually end up in this case shifting our distribution well to the left and this event in the east actually becomes an extreme tail event um, which is really interesting because it wasn't a particularly hot event so grid planners and operators really need to start thinking about situations where we're getting to 50 percent plus penetrations like in, in this example um, they're no longer going to be driven by what we traditionally think stresses the system. So the next example I'm going to show is going to show this even more clearly. This is the coldest period in the seven year record. February 3rd um, was uh, the coldest, had the most heating degree days in the entire record. And the second had the sixth most uh, heating degree days. All the others were uh, top 40. Um, this was a real record breaking event. The cold reached all the way down into southern Texas and Mexico. Uh, El Paso had snow. Uh, the temperature was, I think, 17 degrees for a daily high, um, 17 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so very, very cold. And so you can see the extreme load excursion in, uh, in ERCOT. We are way, way into the tails. Um, so if we compare that to a, to a period just one day later, a year earlier, um, we see that this period had fairly normal loads. Um, it was cool, but not particularly cold by any means. It was uh, 500th in the record, um, which uh, for winter times, there's 90 days in winter times seven. So, you know, it's, it's, it's off to the, off to the uh, far side of, of being, you know, not colder than normal. So um, on average, the renewables mitigated the load excursion during this major cold wave. Um, and here I'm comparing it to the typical period where the, um, where the load was uh, lower. So I'll go back. This is, again, this is uh, the cold period. You can see um, our loads are well above normal. This is our normal period a year earlier for the same period of time. And these are our net loads compared for the two periods, the, two, the cold period on the left, the uh, normal period on the right. And you see that the uh, cold period, with the exception of Texas, uh, the cold, cold period with the extreme loads um, is actually 
relatively normal from a net load point of view. It shifted it all the way out of the tail. And uh, it's even shifted uh, ERCOT out of the tail for the most part. Yet the, uh, the year earlier when we had fairly normal loads, we had a real um, reduction in renewable resources and we're actually now shifting into the tails. So this is showing how it's driving, how, how this has been driven by the resource versus by the load. So let's have a look at those resources. During the cold wave of uh, 2011, we had very good solar resource. We had very good wind resource, with the exception of the first day in the, uh, in the Eastern Interconnect, um, where the solar resource was lower, um, well above normal in the distributions, um, as you can see um, from, from the plots. Here's the reason why. So here I've got a weather map. There's, there's four weather maps of the evolution. Um, there's a surface plot and then temperature plots below, which are the, the min and max temperatures. And during this cold event, which was very extreme, we have a, basically it's, it's a kind of polar void. It's, it's a uh, type of polar void. Um, and uh, when you get a cold wave, with weather and you um, advancing on the, on the cold front and then you get um, extremely dry cold dense air filtering in behind it in northerly winds and so as a result um, you've got above normal wind resource and then after the cold front I apologize my Bluetooth cut out again as you um, as, as the cold front advances, you get this uh, region of very tight isobars with uh, northerly wind. I'm not sure whether you can see my pointer. Nor the northerly winds come in behind and uh, really boost the, uh, the wind production. At the same time, you've got this subsiding dry air, which uh, leads to clear, sky clear cold skies and excellent solar production. And this is something that we see time and time again. It is not uncommon. Meanwhile, if we look at 2010, our wind resource is way below normal and our solar resource is below normal, and here's why. So this is a weather map um, of that period. We have a very weak system moving into um, the northern tier states. That cold air never gets all the way south. Um, so you do have a little bit of that clearing behind the cold wave. Um, and, uh, and you do have a little storm, but the storm is so weak that it's not really producing a, a major peak in wind generation. Um, the west is sat under high pressure, um, so also has very little wind. And then what happens in these situations is um, that you, you tend to get uh, very, very little uh, wind and you can get uh, fog forming. And so not only have you got low wind, you've also got low solar. And so even though it's not exceptionally cold, and this isn't an exceptionally um, um, kind of extreme system from the traditional point of view, this boring weather is actually creating stress on the grid. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about really briefly is the impact of um, extreme weather um, for extreme tails. This is Hurricane Gustav making landfall across Louisiana. You now see it moving up into the middle of the country. And what you're looking at is the, is the wind resource and the solar resource. It's nighttime right now, so there's no solar, but here comes the solar. You can see that the wind nicely offsets the uh, cloudiness impact. So again, you have that wind-solar synergy. The cold front's about to pick up the hurricane. There's a cold front advancing from the north. And, um, and, the, and the storm will now get picked up by the cold front and, and go off to the northeast. Um, what you can see here is that synoptic scale or large scale weather systems actually have more of an impact on the resource than tropical storms. Tropical storms tend to be small systems. And so even though we think of tropical storms as traditionally having a large impact on society and on the grid, um, from a resource standpoint and how much they stress the supply and demand, um, they uh, aren't particularly significant. They obviously still have the existing impacts on, um, on uh, grid infrastructure, though. And uh, this is the wind and solar resource, just to show you how sort of insignificant it is. Uh, the uh, 
the wind in the west is not affected at all and is lower than normal. The wind in the east is a slight bump from this system. But once a hurricane makes landfall, it loses most of its punch from a wind point of view anyway. Uh, so cutouts aren't a big issue. Uh, and this is the net load during Gustav. And because I'm out of time, I will just advance on to the summary. So basically, temperature stops being the primary modulator of the supply demand balance, um, the weather driven uh, generation becomes the most important. Wind and solar are synergistic. Um, the supply constraints no longer coincide with record warmth and cold, shouldn't be expected to. Um, and concurrent weakness in wind and solar becomes the big driver. And the, this is really important. The weather that causes this is often boring. It's not weather that we think of as being high impact. Um, and it will become high impact in the future. One of the things we didn't talk about was hydro and the fact that uh, on the other side of this, we get into situations with oversupply, particularly in the springtime. And another thing which Ulrich was just discussing is that now the impact of cutout due to high temperatures, due to icing and due to snow um, matters and also low temperatures now, now matters. And that's a, that's a work in progress on this project too. So with that, I'll give you the final takeaway, which is that grid planning needs to consider all the attributes of weather-driven supply and demand, especially uh, the correlations in the net um, load pales. And I'll leave you with a quote from Michael Liebrick, which I think is particularly pertinent to, to this talk and, uh, and, and, uh, and also the entire of the shift to renewables. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Justin. Um, I appreciate that. And sorry, everyone, I dropped off in between the last transition. So thank you, Charlie, for uh, saving the day. I just want to remind everyone that uh, if you have questions, please uh, submit them on Slido, uh, as you can see on the, on the uh, screen here. Um, we're going to move on to Gord Steven. Uh, so Gord Steven is a doctoral student in electrical and, co and computer engineering at the University of Washington. He also holds a part-time staff position at the National Renewable Energy uh, Laboratory, where he leads the development of the lab's open source probabilistic resource adequacy suite, otherwise known as PRAS. Uh, Gord, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks very much, Josh. So uh, it's going to be a little bit different from some of the other ones in the session in that uh, it's not so much about extreme weather events in of themselves and more about the implications of extreme weather events on uh, grid and power system resource adequacy modeling and assessment. Um, as a disclaimer, I am not a weather person by any stretch of the imagination, so I'm coming at it from more the, the power system perspective. So I'll start by kind of just getting everyone on the same page of what I mean when I say resource adequacy and resource adequacy assessment. Uh, very broadly speaking, resource adequacy is uh, the idea that uh, a utility or a system planner of some kind has procured sufficient resources, and that could be on the supply side, that could be uh, transmissions for, for deliverability of power, that could be on the demand side, uh, but procured sufficient resources to satisfy uh, load to a particular level of reliability in their system. And the operative word there uh, is really reliability and reliable. And in a resource adequacy context, what we usually mean when we say uh, reliable is uh, a quantitative uh, definition relative to some adequacy or risk metric. So that could be something like a planning reserve margin, or in a, pro in a probabilistic analysis, that could be something like a loss of load expectation. And when I say probabilistic resource adequacy, specifically what I'm talking about is uh, to say very broad wide, diverse range of potential states and conditions in which the system could find itself and, and uh, ascribe a probability or a likelihood of being in that particular situation to that uh, context. And based on all of these different potential scenarios and the probabilities associated with those, we can derive uh, a probability distribution of outcomes from those scenarios. Uh, based on those uh, outcomes of interest and the probability distributions of those outcomes, uh, we can come up with probabilistic metrics like loss of load expectation or expected unserved energy, which are descriptive statistics for those distributions. Uh, so I find it useful to put it down into kind of three uh, components or stages. 
so the first component has to do with the uncertainty that you're actually looking to model in your probabilistic analysis uh, and quantifying or parametrizing that uncertainty in some way so that you're able to systematically explore and assign probabilities to uh, the different potential input operating conditions that the system could, could find itself in. The second stage has to do with actually mapping those inputs to the, the outcomes that you're interested in. So this involves some kind of operational simulation of the actual power system. Um, and there's lots of interesting questions to do with trade-offs between representational fidelity and computational efficiency when you're doing this simulation. But for the purposes of this talk today, we're basically going to treat this middle step as a black box and kind of gloss over any kind of implementation details in that. And then on the output side of things, we have the actual outcomes that we're interested uh, in, in understanding or studying uh, and deciding what uh, those out, output metrics are that we're interested in and also how to map the distribution of those outcomes down to descriptive statistics or risk metrics that are actually useful and informative in understanding the nature of uh, resource adequacy risks to the power system and whether or not a system can, could, sh could or should be considered resource adequate based on those risk metrics. So I'm going to primarily talk about the input uncertainty side of things, although at the end I'll, I'll come back and briefly touch on the, the outcome and risk metric aspect of this as well. So traditionally, when we've done power system resource adequacy analysis, it's been focused almost exclusively on the idea of uh, probabilistically modeling mechanical outages of thermal generators. Um, and the underlying discrete probability theory uh, that, that is, is useful for describing these types of outages is, is really nice and elegant and tractable. We can scale it up to large systems fairly easily. Uh, we, we, this is a fairly mature uh, kind of analysis. We've been doing this for decades and decades now, and we have a pretty good handle on, on what that actually involves. Unfortunately, as the previous presenters have made clear, this is in moving forward not where the real interesting aspects of uncertainty in power system operations and planning are, are going to be. Uh, and that's going to be more on the load and the uh, availability of renewable resources. And, and unfortunately, we don't really have as much uh, 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 an established uh, canon of, of techniques or, or established methods for dealing with uh, and probabilistically the evidence of load and renewable generation across time. And of course, these are all uh, driven uh, very heavily by uh, weather. So what this really boils down to is uh, needing an, an understanding of the probabilistic evolution uh, of looking at some future point in time. Uh, and because we want to uh, consider uh, various operational aspects of the power system, uh, we want a uh, forecast or some kind of probabilistic estimate of what weather in the future is going to look like at a fairly granular, you know, hourly or so level. Uh, and we're looking out for planning purposes years or sometimes even decades into the future. Like I said, I'm not a weather person at all, but even I can tell you an hourly weather forecast for you know 10 years from now uh, is not the most meaningful exercise to undertake. Uh, so typically, what we do to get around that is uh, look at historical uh, load data and historical load data and say, okay, you know, and there may be some adjustments we make to that, right? Like scaling up load for, for future economic growth or something like that, or um, using weather data to infer hypothetical output of a, you know, a wind farm that hasn't actually been built yet, things like that. Um, but ultimately what we're doing is we're looking at this historical data and more or less hoping that it is at least somewhat representative of what the future system operating conditions we want to study are. Um, and I mean, there's certainly uh, lots of interesting issues about uh, uh, climate change. I know that's actually a, a valid uh, thing to be doing. But even if you put those aside, there's still some issues in terms of uh, the availability of data. So just by definition of uh, how a power system is designed, most of the time periods or most of the observations that we have available for historical, uh, from historical data are uh, basically describing times in which the system is not in a particularly risky situation from a resource adequacy perspective. Um, and, and almost by definition, because of that, uh, the actual you know, extreme hail events that we're most interested in studying are um, more or less common. And so trying to do probabilistic description um, or, or analysis based on uh, those events is inherently going to be sens very sensitive to the actual data itself and perturbations in that data uh, and noise, uh, which is 
really not a, uh, a great place to be when you're trying to, to uh, understand whether or not your, your power system is really adequate or not. So there's a few things that we can do to uh, get around that. The first and most obvious is just to use more historical data. This is actually really important when it comes to understanding interannual variability. If you just use one year of, of uh, low data and wind and solar data, uh, you don't really have any way of knowing if that one year represented a particularly hot summer or a you know, harsh cold winter, or if the wind and solar resource were particularly good or bad in that particular year. So, so looking over a wider historical horizon is incredibly important. Uh, unfortunately, on the demand side, it's it's a lot more complicated because, you know, say I have 10 years of historical data, the underlying economic uh, activity conditions and technology adoption at the beginning of that time period and at the end can be very different. So you think of things like um, like growth in air conditioning load or adoption of electric vehicles as things that um, would prevent a, a, a load uh, profile from 10 or 15 years ago from actually being all that representative of what a load profile 10 or 15 years into the future might look like. So there's there's a lot of challenges associated with that, but that's usually kind of the best we can do. Uh, one approach that, that sometimes is taken is to fit some kind of statistical model to uh, the, the limited historical data that we do have. The idea being that then, then once you have this statistical model that describes that data, you can uh, draw probabilistic or random samples from that model uh, and kind of fill in the fact that you're, you're missing uh, uh, actual historical observations or of those tail events. Fortunately, there's no such thing as a free loan. That data or that uh, model itself is only only as good as the data that you use to, to train it and fit those parameters for the model. Um, and so if you have uh, a lot if you have, uh, limitations on your ability to describe uh, tail events based on limitations in your data, then you don't really have any particular expectation that the model is going to do a, an accurate or um, a realistic job of, of describing those events either. One specialization on this idea of fitting a statistical model is to use a more specialized type of statistical model that focuses exclusively on modeling those tail events, so through things like extreme value theory. Um, and again, if you have limited data to work with, um, you're limited in how in the, the fidelity of uh, what you're able to uh, model. That, that hasn't changed at all. Uh, but the benefit with uh, an extreme value theory type statistical analysis is at least now you're, you're using a particular method or, and you have a particular focus on the tail events of the distributions, which are what actually drive uh, the resource adequacy risk metrics that you uh, develop. So it may be a more appropriate approach um, given your, the specific interests you have in resource adequacy applications. Uh, the, the takeaway I guess I'd like to give with this session is just we don't have a silver bullet. There's um, no uh, magical answer for, for dealing with this issue of, of it being hard to model these types of events probabilistically. One thing we can do at least is to be uh, more clear and transparent about uh, the implications of these data limitations on the actual results that we're producing. Uh, so uh, quantifying the uncertainty in our results that, are, that is as a result of having limited data, input data and things like statistical bootstrap methods um, are useful for, for providing numbers around uh, the range of uncertainty that were uh, potentially ascribable to the fact that we're working with uh, a limited historical data set to try and describe these less common but incredibly important from a research adequacy perspective uh, problems. So now I'll switch gears uh, and briefly just talk about the, the output side of the equation as well. So uh, historically, uh, we're really primarily interested in expectation-based risk metrics. So on average, you know, I, I met, talked about developing that distribution of potential outcomes through some probabilistic process. Uh, generally, we're, we only focus on the average value from that distribution. So expected unserved energy is the average amount of unserved energy over the simulation period. Loss of load expectation is the average number of periods in which uh, there's some load dropping occurring over the course of that expectation. Um, and extreme events obviously go into creating an average, um, but because they're less likely, they kind of get smoothed out um, and, and diluted in terms of their impact. But I would suggest that it's still also reasonable to want to uh, ask ourselves how bad could things actually, you know, if, if we're in a bad year, what does that actually look like? What is, what is a, an unlucky draw from the, the input uncertainty that we're dealing with? How does that manifest itself? 
Um, and so we have alternative uh, options for uh, how we summarize those distributions that, that we come up with. And metrics value at risk, or CVAR, uh, is, that's one example of a way in which we could study, um, given all these things that could happen, what, what are the worst case scenarios uh, look like? What's the, the, the average in, say, you know, the worst 5% of inflation, for example? Uh, and, and by using those types of metrics, we can kind of more explicitly communicate the potential impact of extreme weather events um, on power system operations and on power system reliability and resource adequacy. So just to summarize, um, probabilistically modeling extreme weather events uh, is hard. Um, and so as a result, the, the methods that we use in our resource adequacy models today don't do a very good job with it. Historically, this hasn't been as important uh, a factor to consider, but is going to become more and more important moving forward. Um, at a bare minimum, we should make sure we're clearly communicating the potential impacts uh, of data limitations and of our inability to accurately model probabilistically how these events manifest themselves. Uh, and we should also be considering resource adequacy metrics that explicitly communicate uh, what the potential impact of those kinds of extreme events are on power system uh, resource adequacy. So thanks very much. That's all I've got. Great. Thanks, Gord. Um, so we're going to move on to the uh, Q&A session uh, now. Just a reminder that you can uh, continue to submit questions on this on the Slido uh, web browser. I'm going to turn it over to Craig to facilitate the uh, questions and, and discussion period here. Just note that we will plan to go uh, around five minutes uh, beyond the hour if you can stick with us to, to have this discussion. Uh, so, Craig. Thanks, Josh, and thanks to all the, the speakers today. Um, and just getting the signal from Charlie that we're going to go to five minutes after the top of the hour, I think it helps us have some time for some really good questions, which we've had submitted to the, uh, the Slido interface. So I appreciate those coming in. Um, there's several questions here for uh, Ulrich specifically. Uh, I'm going to try to synthesize a few of them just for you know economy's sake. But um, Ulrich, relative to uh, your e uh, severe event um, uh, forecasting uh, presentation, um, can you speak to the following question? What, what techniques are valuable to you as a forecaster for predicting the probability of icing, its duration on wind turbines? Um, and what metrics do you use typically, uh, or would you suggest uh, for evaluating and tuning those techniques? So if the question is on, on, on what techniques we use, so it, it, it's weather forecasting itself and as the the guys before me just mentioned is that the data is one of the crucial things. So the problem with the forecasting and the tuning of the models is that there is not much data. So the last winters was really cold and we had lots, we had some icing events, but until I think 2017, there was only rare events which we really followed and where we had models in place. So now as we have some data, it's possible to tune models. What do we do for forecasting? Which models we use is physics. So really try to make a good forecast on uh, freezing rain and other aspects which are important for the forecasting. And the other thing is to tune that on the, on the historical data and the events we have. So this is in both things for uh, to making the model of icing. The second thing is how we do measure the metrics. Our metrics, standard metrics is RMSE and MAE which we use everywhere. The important thing to, to really to evaluate is how long if the icing occurs, how long it really holds on. And this is one of the questions which I see here as well, no? uh, how long the icing is there. And the, the question is forecast icing rain for when the forecast occurs and otherwise, how long the situation holds on. And this is some different weather pattern which we need there. So if the icing is on the place existing, and afterwards, if it's getting warm, then they start producing quite fast. But if it's staying cold and they have no heating package, then sometimes it can stay for several days until the ice falls off. Great. Uh, th thanks, Ulrich. And in that, you just hit the second question I was going to raise with you, uh, just based on your experience uh, relative to the length of time icing remains on turbines. 
Uh, Justin, I uh, wanted to jump to you. There's a, a, a couple of good questions here related to your presentation. Uh, is there any indication to you whether the extreme events that you've discussed uh, are increasing in magnitude or frequency overall or in specific regions? Is that something you can, you can comment on? Yeah, it's a really good question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, good. Um, so there is some fairly good evidence that um, the frequency of um, extreme cold waves is increasing um, over time. Uh, you know, uh, Jennifer, um, I'm trying to remember her last name now, the lady at, uh, at uh, Rutgers University has done a fair amount of work um, in that area. But remember that those extreme events that we think of as extreme are no longer what cause extreme tails as we start to build out the system more and more and more. So again, we have this disconnect that what people find interesting to study in, in weather is stuff that impacts society like snow and ice and big windstorms and stuff like that. And what really matters from a grid planning point of view is, is boring weather increasing? Are days with large high pressure systems where there's no wind increasing? Are days that are really foggy increasing? And these are not questions that researchers typically are looking into. Um, so, you know, the first thing to do is to acknowledge the problem, and, and, and I don't think we've done that yet. Um, so, so the answer is perhaps um, uh, they're increasing, um, but, but that we need to do a lot more research and we need to get really focused on, on what is going to affect the grid in the, in the future instead of focusing on stuff that um, actually doesn't matter as much as it used to. Um, so, you know, there's two things going on. One, one is, one is that uh, generation um, is becoming more and more affected by weather and lack of generation is affected by boring weather. Um, and, and the other thing is that uh, renewables are actually helping improve grid resilience in the extreme cases. They actually, you know, they, it, it's, we need to robustly prove that, but anecdotally, it really does appear, and it makes sense from a weather perspective, that when you have extreme cold waves, you have good renewable resources. When you have extreme heat waves, you have good renewable resources. The way we need to focus our attention is actually these moderate events with very poor resources. Great. Thanks, Justin. I think you hit on a couple of other questions here that have um, been uh, coming in through Slido as well. Um, so I, I appreciate that. Um, so uh, I had a, a question that uh, we have a question here I wanted to direct to you, Gord, um, in the interest of time. Are you using any real world example uh, weather? And uh, let's see, uh, sorry, I just lost my, uh, <laughs> uh, lost the question here, but uh, are you using any real world example weather and power system data in your research um, to actually show how telemetrics like CBAR could be important? So any, any real world sort of empirical example data uh, that, that have been used in your, in your studies? Yeah, um, so in my UDAP hat, uh, not so much of our, um, speaking as uh, on the NREL side of things, we're, we're working with, with real world, uh, looking at real world data all the time. Um, in terms of how that relates to CVAR, part of that sort of comes down to a, almost a policy question or a, a regulatory question of as a power system planner or as someone who's regulating a power system planner, um, what do you personally care about from a policy perspective in terms of designing a resource adequate system and what, what should you be caring about? Um, so a system that on average is reliable and is um, uh, uh, good from a cost perspective maybe has, uh, still has the potential for, for very uh, poor performance under some tail event. And, and to what extent do you, uh, are you willing to spend extra money to mitigate that event, even the position that you're, you're mitigating events, you know, the probability of that happening is low and it may never actually happen. So there's sort of a, you know, at that point, you're, you're starting to talk about resilience as well and, and you know, how much money you're willing to spend for mitigating events that uh, metrics like CVAR can inform you about. Um, but uh, whether or not you deem that important or not uh, comes to kind of a policy question, um, which I think is interesting. 
uh, as well, but also kind of shows you know the blurriness here between uh, doing a probabilistic analysis and then how you actually apply those results and where kind of the art of determining how you map from that probability distribution of outcomes down to actionable metrics that you're going to design your system against comes into play. Great, thanks, Gord. Um, believe we're just about out of time. Um, I think Ulrich, you had uh, just noted to me you you wanted to make a comment. I think potentially on on the question for Justin. Uh, did you want to, to to speak up on that in the the short time we have left? Yeah, maybe maybe, that maybe, just, just, uh, maybe just a short general comment here. What what Jen, what Justin is talking about is more the planning issue, and I talk talk more about operations. And I agree with 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 Justin that on the planning side, the extreme event I'm talking from is not really the important stuff. So, so it's really the, uh, uh, the boring weather, which is important for the planning, where you have high loads in general. And so, it, it, but for, for the operations, the extreme event, when I talk on which really sounds like extreme events, it's, it's important stuff. So it's really a totally different story for planning and for operations. Yeah, thanks for that clarification, Ulrich, I agree. Yeah. And this is really, this is really clear. It's totally different situations because on planning, what, what is in operations, the extreme events, this is what, what we saw in our last presentation. It's, it's very difficult to include that in planning because it's really interrupting the whole system. You're not able to integrate, in, in, integrate that into planning. But in operations, this is a situation where this Petra is there and say, oh, wow, five gigawatts are missing now. What to do? And so this is a totally different story. And this is not the boring weather. So for operation, the boring weather is boring because planning is done and they're able to mitigate that. But the extreme event where we leave cut off icing five gigawatt and then when it comes in again, I don't know. This is a question here. Just for clarification that the other two and me, we're talking about different things. Great, yeah, thank you, Auric, and thanks, Justin. Thanks to all the speakers uh, for answering these questions. I think we've just about hit time here. So I'm interested to back over to you, Josh. Yeah, Thank great. Session. Thanks, uh, thanks, Craig, and thanks to the, the panelists. Uh, thank you again for the great presentations. Um, the uh, round of applause is deafening in my, in my uh, headset here. So thank you again. And thank you everyone else for your participation and for uh, submitting your questions to Slido. Uh, this has been a very timely and interesting session and has provided some good food for thought for us all uh, and some ideas that we can take home. Uh, so for those of you who are concerned about webinar withdrawal symptoms, uh, I'd like to remind you that there are three more technical sessions that will be held during the remainder of the month. Uh, you will find the full schedule of the upcoming sessions on the eSIG website, and you are all invited to attend. The next session is on control and dispatch of hybrid resources and it'll be held next Tuesday, uh, June 23rd at 2 p.m. Eastern. So thanks again for your particip uh, participation. Uh, stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you then. Bye, everyone.